Please like, subscribe and share. Your likes and shares can help us take Athenium and Northeast to the world. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay connected on Facebook for regular content. Hello and welcome to a specially curated session with the in-house team of Athenium, Deep and Nandini. We bring to you a series on the traditional festivals of Northeast titled Sites of Sociocultural Exchange, Festivals in Northeast India. In the first episode, we will talk about festivals from the state of Mizoram. And to initiate the conversation on Mizos and the state, I request Deep and Nandini to start. Well, to introduce, Mizoram is a state in northeastern India with uh, Aizol as its seat of government and capital city. The name of the state is derived from Mizo, which is the self-described name of the native inhabitants, and Ram, which in the Mizo language means land. Yes, means if we have to talk about uh, the means where uh, this uh, Mizos have originated, then the generally accepted idea is that the Mizos as a part of a great Mongoloid wave of migration that have happened from China, which was also later moved out to India to their present in, uh, present habitat. Okay, so the, I mean, there's a possibility, uh, possibility that the Mizos came from Xinglung or Xinglung Shan, uh, located on the banks of the river Yalong in China. So they first settled in the Shan state and then they moved to the Cabo Valley to Kampat and then to Chin Hills in the middle of the 16th century. That is what is the commonly held idea regarding where the Mizos have come from. Yes, and from what we also understand that the earliest Mizos who migrated to India were known as the Cookies. And uh, the second batch of immigrants were called the New Cookies, right? And um, the Lushais were the last of the Mizo tribe to migrate to India. Now, the Mizo history in the 18th and the 19th century is marked by many instances of tribal raids and retaliatory expeditions of security, etc. And the Mizo Hills was formally declared um, as a part of the British India by a proclamation in 1895. Uh, North and South Hills, if I'm correct, were united into Lushai Hills district in 1898 with Aizol as its headquarters. Yeah, and uh, Piyashi, um, to add on, it was actually during the British regime that a political awakening among the Mizos in the Lushai Hills started taking shape. And the first political party, the Mizo Common People's Union, was formed on the 9th of April 1946. So the party was later, you know, it was renamed as uh, Mizo Union. And as the day of independence grew nearer, the Constituent Assembly of India um, set up an advisory committee to deal with matters relating to the minorities and the tribals. A subcommittee under the chairmanship of Gopinath Bordeloi was also formed to advise the Constituent Assembly on the tribal affairs in the Northeast. Yes, I means it was after this that the Mizo Union, it had submitted a resolution of uh, this subcommittee, which was basically demanding inclusion of all the Mizo inhabited area to the adjacent Lusai Hills. Okay, so after, uh, or we can say following the Bordeloi subcommittee suggestion, a certain amount of autonomy was also granted, uh, which was accepted by the government, and it was enshrined in the form of the sixth schedule of the Indian constitution. So the Lusai Hill Autonomous District Council, it came into being in 1952, uh, followed by the formation of these bodies, which uh, ultimately led to the abolition of chieftainship in the major society. Yes. Yes. And I think with this premise that you have set a little bit into the idea of the state of Mizoram and how the tribes are located, we can begin our discussion on the festivals of Mizoram. And on this uh, premise, we start that Festivals celebrate a consciousness grounded on the guiding philosophies of a community, right? And wherein the community life is reinvigorated. And festival is an event. It can also be looked as a phenomenon. And I think there is no community or society which does not have its own traditional local festivals. It is part of every human culture, right? And therefore, if we look at the etymology of the term, it finds or it's derived from the Latin term festival. And the contemporary English definition says that festival is a sacred or a profane time of celebration 
It is marked by special observances. Uh, it is an annual affair celebrating an important event or a person or during or it's a harvest of an important product. And the community becomes important here because the community looks at a festival not just as a commercial venture, which is it is becoming in the modern times, but it is reasonably an event which sort of, you know, is an exhibition of the community's culture and the history of the community members. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I find it very interesting. And I must state that um, festivals have underpinnings, both social and symbolic, where both the social and symbolic undertones of the festival are pedantically associated to a series of manifested ideas. Um, and this, you know, this is where the community recognizes um, as vital to, to its philosophy, worldview, social character, historical consciousness, and to its physical survival, which is ultimately honored through any festival. Uh, and it is through this understanding of uh, of the festival as manifestation of a particular way of life that we today draw our attention and focus towards Mizora. Yes, means if we have to talk about uh, the main festivals, one of the very important festival in the state of Mizoram is uh, the Chapchar Kut festival. Okay, so the name actually Chapchar Kut, it literally means a festival that held uh, during the period when bamboos and trees that have been cut down are being you know, waited to dry and they have to be burned for zooming during the month of the March. Okay, so bamboo plays a very, very important uh, role here. Okay, so during this brief layoff period of zooming, the Mijo ancestors could have all the time for themselves. So most of the time they spend uh, their laser uh, with hunting games, then fishing was also part of their culture. So, so this Chapcharkut festival, it have evolved uh, during the period of 1450 to 1600 AD when the Mizo forefathers, they means inhabit this place called Lengtlang. Okay, so in the olden days, uh, this festival used to last for days, actually, and in the run up to the grand finale. So they used to have this grand finale and uh, there were, uh, or we can say there are some well laid down steps which have to be followed means in, in order to festival to be complete. So means everyone in the village have a role to play. And one of the very important, uh, like one of the sections that plays a very important role in the festival is the youth. Okay, so youth were involved in every stage, uh, like they will be uh, means involved in the preparation and also in the festival also. Okay, so it's uh, this festival is basically designed to be also a festival of celebration of joy. So one of the other important feature of this festival is also that uh, that all disputes and differences that are there, okay, in the community should be settled down during this time, okay, because it is a time for celebration. It means even alteration between married couples was also a kind of taboo during this festival. And one of the other festivals, since it's happening at a time like um, means during March, so what is also uh, we can see is that there is abundance of supply of meat, okay, so which which has to be taken care of by the society or the community. So there will be abundant supply of meat must be there, and there should also be home brewed liquor, okay, which plays a very important role. It should be in uh, like uh, means overflowing to keep the spirits very high. Then one of the other thing that is important in this festival is also that uh, dance plays a very, very important role. So the people uh, dance, I mean, all their, uh, like, means all their cares and made merry all night long, we can say. Okay, so basically that sums up how the Mizos celebrate this Sapchar Kut in the olden days, okay, when they were heathens. The festival celebration also featured the traditional bamboo dance, which is known as the Chirao. Okay, so that's all about Sapchar Kut that I can tell you, yes. Yes, and I think the, with Chapchar Kut, I think all of us agree that in today's time, I hope we would have that leisure of celebrating the community, the community life for weeks at a stretch, you know, and merry make and meet everybody. I think uh, that would be lovely. But, uh, you know, with the advent of the modern times, we have also noticed that festivals like Chapchar Kut um, have undergone changes from what the traditional setup was. Like, for instance, um, in the modern version of Chapchar Kut, the usage of liquor um, has been done away with, which traditionally was an important part and uh, parcel of the festival, right? And now it is one of the biggest festivals in Mizoram. And a commercial angle sort of has been uh, engaged with it, with, and it has turned into a huge tourist attraction. It hosts uh, diplomats from foreign countries. There are themes during these festivals, handloom exhibitions, 
food stalls and concerts so one can also see that how these festivals are navigating these changes you know from tradition to modernity yeah, absolutely and you know with time and uh, with changes in the profile of the demography certain shifts are always witnessed in these traditional festivals and uh, now that both uh, you and deep have set the tone i must talk about meenput which is regarded as the oldest festival of the mizos uh, a ceremony organized for commemorating the dead uh, meen means uh, maize or corn and it is observed after the maize or corn is ripe in the months of august and september so what they do is they take the first produce from the harvest and present it to the departed souls who are believed to visit the homes during that festival uh, and apart from just the product uh, that you know the, the, you know the produce of the of the harvest they are uh, uh, various types of articles favorite items are also kept such as clothes and ornaments and any other objects that rings a memory of that ancestor uh yet another interesting observation is that the festival happens um unanimously in all the mizo households and does not have any differentiation based on religion so right from the rich to the poor the young to the old all and everybody come together to celebrate this festival with equal importance Uh, the meenput festival can also be seen similar to the festivals commemorating the dead which are celebrated in the southeast asian countries yes okay so one of the things that i had that i have noticed uh, like in most festivals that we celebrate in india and also in the northeast is that most festivals are uh, related to means agriculture harvest okay so most yeah. of the festivals are means related to agriculture so one of the other important festival in the state of mizoram is called the paulkut Okay, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's called the Paul Put. Yeah. It, it's a festival in Mizoram, and it is held in the month of December. Okay, so Paul, which basically means straw. Okay, hence Paul Put means that it's a straw harvest festival. So it means it's a typical uh, festival celebrated in December for two days post harvest, and it is observed in the month of December, and also before the beginning of the spring season. so uh, means according to people uh, or we can say the local belief system it is believed that in 19 uh, in 1450 a famine struck around uh, this place and it lasted for three centuries till 1780 so because of this reason there was no major crop production which resulted in extreme poverty uh, and because of this the people asked for blessing to the almighty and soon after that there was a major crop production along with a good rainfall which seemed to change the entire scenario of agriculture therefore people took it as a sign of blessing and so the people started celebrating the paul put festival in order to offer basically a kind of offering of thanks to the almighty and they are asking for blessing them with a good harvest so this paul put festival is usually followed by a day of rest and this is known as the mid epwar awin ni okay so in modern times the time of festival has been reformed so that it can be also celebrated on the same day as children's day right and you know if we look at these uh, discussion and if we look at the trajectory of all the three festivals it is pretty evident that a uh, lot of changes have seeped in right and therefore it's important to use a critical lens beyond the idea of just uh, tourism attraction or merry making and understand the significance of these festivals that um, you know festivals take place at special times and places and they also become spaces or they serve to intensify the societal values right by bringing in sharp focus during these times and it is becoming important for us to know that festivals unveil how people and communities want to exhibit themselves to the others and there is the space of exhibition and identity and representation um, that communities carry out through these festivals i agree i agree to you know what you've said and uh, importantly you know uh, performances and illustrations in these festivals they also find a space in the mass media and thereby what happens is that you know it aids in the process of building local and regional identities so this implies that cultural festivals ha- uh, you know have become a show ground where local cultural identities are enunciated 
Yes, and also yeah. it means if we look at the festivals in the context of globalization, what we have also seen is that many of these festivals, we can call them indigenous festivals or local festivals, that uh, they have a lot of cultural performances. Okay, so this cultural performances can actually be seen as some kind of an assertion of rights and also a call for recognition. So while it also uh, means ambody that, or we can say that it shows some kind of performative ethics that at times uh, which exceeded this liberal discourses, okay, so, but cultural festivals are also one of the few uh, consistently positive space where the local indigenous communities, they try to forge and assert a more constructive view of themselves, okay, and it happens intergenerationally also, and also as a part of a drive, uh, which seeks to get recognition and also respect, okay, that they are distinct cultures in local, national, and international context. Yes, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, from what you and uh, Nandini have been saying, we can argue that cultural festivals like a Chapchar Court, Mim Court or Paul Court or any other festival provides a potent space for intercultural accommodations uh, to be negotiated on largely indigenous, quote unquote, indigenous or local terrains, right? And these events, therefore, strengthen the indigenous agency and reset the terms of cross-cultural engagements uh, then the contested sovereignties for at least, you know, during that duration of these staged uh, encounters and staged um, social gatherings, etc. Yeah, and, uh, you know, when you look at these festivals from a broader canvas, um, we must, uh, you know, look at, look at these beyond the merrymaking and beyond the celebration, which are definitely an integral part of the, of the festival. But uh, we must provide that space, uh, you know, where we can discuss the situations where intercultural communication and representations are taking place. And there is a social, political and economic participation uh, and assertion of the identity of that particular, uh, you know, demography and uh, geography both, enabling the creation and recreation of histories which generate community values, customs, behaviors and, you know, what not. So, yeah, that. Yes, please. Actually, while um, doing some research for this particular podcast, I, I came to, I mean, across this paper called Christianization and its Impact on Mesoculture. So where uh, Dr. Rebecca Angom, she's, a department, she's from the Department of English, uh, Panchunga University or University College, Aizol. So she's from Mizoram and she argues that, uh, that the social life of the Mizo was controlled by the religious and cultural uh, life in the past. Okay, so before the, maybe before the arrival of the British, and subsequently, uh, the coming of the missionaries, the Mizos were having a kind of nomadic habit and also a volatile mentality. So the life, uh, or we can say the way of life of the Mizo was immensely transformed by the Christian missionaries. And in 19, uh, 1894, uh, two English Baptist missionaries of the Artington means Aborigines mission, and their names are J.H. Uh, Lorraine and means F.W. Savage. They landed in the Lusai Hills in the present day Mizoram and they began their missionary works. Yeah. Yeah. And Deep, you're actually right in pointing that out. And I think what uh, Dr. Rebecca is also saying that, uh, and there's a larger academic debate around it saying that, you know, the introduction of education and primarily a new religion, uh, quote unquote Christianity in this case, changed the perspective and the worldview of the Miso community. And I think this is something that we see in all other tribal communities also. Right. So in other words, a new culture, custom, tradition and identity of the Mizos develop. So she's also saying that though the Mizos cherished the old cultures and traditions, but a lot of change um, has been taking place and to a point that certain changes are beyond recognition. Right. And in the contemporary times, in this whole game of you know, acculturation and deculturation, um, there has been a phenomena where there is a movement also sort of to go back to the traditional roots and customs. Yeah, but uh, you know, Piyashi, at the same time, they also agree that their culture has been uh, blatantly influenced by Western culture uh, in terms of how they now dress, uh, their food habits, mannerisms, uh, music, and various other ideas. The main tradition, uh, you know, the main traditional festivals of the Mizos, like 
as we've discussed, the Chapchar court, Meem court, and Paul court uh, of the ancient times are slowly and gradually uh, fading away from the society after they have adopted Christianity. So today, the main festival of the Mizos, uh, you can consider it to be the Christmas, even though effort has been put to revive the Chapchar Kut again. So rapid changes are being seen in the celebration of these festivals that need to be looked at critically. And scholars also argue that there is an ongoing process of deculturation in the socio-cultural milieu of the Mizos. Yes, um, absolutely. And I think um, this is the premise of Athenium and this particular podcast on the sites of socio-cultural exchange festivals in the Northeast India wants to bring to into the deliberation that, uh, and we hope that we can create a space to discuss about the traditional festivals, looking at it from a very, very critical perspective, using a critical lens, and gaze at it not just as a space of uh, tourism and merrymaking and that they are tribal communities. So you have that whole mystifying um, lens that people have been using. And it becomes important that we shed these stereotypical lenses and engage in a critical manner to understand these festivals, which say so much about a community's culture, traditions, identity, value system, etc. So with this, we have come to the end of today's first episode of our podcast. And we have also placed some references in the description section for any one of you who may want to explore these topics further. Stay tuned to Athenium for the second episode of Sites of Social Cultural Exchange and Festivals in Northeast India. And thank you, Deep and Nandini, for this excellent deliberation. Thank you so much, Piyasi. Thank you so much.